the COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating for restaurants in India and across the world. Uh, overall in India, uh, 1.5 million jobs have been lost in the restaurant industry. My guess is Delhi would be about 25% of that. That's former National Restaurant Association of India President Samir Kukreja, one of the guests on this episode of Bad Table Manners. I'm your host, Meher Varma. This series explores high and low food cultures in India. It travels in and out of the food industry, examines the history of contemporary food lifestyles, and probes the celebration of Indian food in a country where half the population still doesn't have access to a daily healthy, nutritious meal. I'm not really interested in the polite conversations people have around dinner tables, or maybe even sitting at a dinner table at all. Behind every Indian kitchen and every fancy dinner plate that's created at a lovely restaurant in India is a whole world that is often thought of as unsuitable for dinner table conversation. But here's a place to bring those discussions to life. In this episode, we'll explore how the pandemic has impacted the food service industry in India. This is a conversation that I think is important to have, even as many businesses report total recovery and some even thriving success. Because most of us are hearing the news from a distance and still don't know what it took for many owners to make it through this tough time or what it takes all the time. What it's actually like to run a real restaurant, like a brick and mortar establishment in a city that is increasingly filled with cloud kitchens or what are sometimes more creepily called ghost kitchens. I don't know about you, but when I hear that term, I think of apparitions making pasta, which I impatiently want in 15 minutes because I paid for it. But of course, it's not an apparition. It's a real person who I will never know, likely working overtime for me, simply because I'm a paying customer. Yes, it's all hard work, but thankfully, Jitain Sachte, the owner of a wildly popular cafe called Jug Mag Thela, is here to stop us from falling into that simple trap of thinking that all ghost kitchens are evil and the brick and mortar establishment is somehow agency endowing or premised on actual creative talent. Through some serious myth-busting and personal storytelling, he reminds us not to romanticize that, oh, I just own a cafe narrative. Running a restaurant, it turns out, is rarely cute. Whether you will survive or not depends on how deep your pockets are. That does not make your restaurant successful. We'll also hear from Kenaz Mesman, the owner of the uber-successful chain Theo Broma. She'll talk about sustaining a business and gender inequality. Things may be better as far as gender goes, but the playing field still continues to be far from even in the Indian food industry. As women, we have to make ourselves heard and create a change that we want to see. There's no point in just continuously crying about it. I think we must be part of the change. But for now, back to the pandemic. It's an understatement to say that restaurants have had it really bad. Former NRAI president Samir Kukreja, who is the founder and CEO of the boutique consulting firm Tasanya Hospitality, gives us a glimpse into the real numbers. The restaurant industry in Delhi, like in other parts of India and perhaps across the world, has been significantly impacted by COVID over the last 18 months. I estimate about 20 to 25% of the organized restaurants in Delhi have shut down, largely due to uh, inflexible landlords who have not helped the tenants with reducing rent, especially during the lockdowns when restaurants were forced to close. But he says other food businesses have had it even worse. And in terms of the unorganized, which is the roadside, the kiosks and the counters, I think the closure there is about... 35 to 40%. Overall in India, uh, 1.5 million jobs have been lost in the restaurant industry. An article published in the International Journal of Advanced Research by Kashish Kurana shows that nearly 65% of Delhi restauranteurs who were surveyed in the first half of 2020 said that their profits were affected, quote, to a great extent, end quote, by the pandemic. More than 23% of those surveyed had to cut their workers' pay in half. Again, a tragic truth about the world is proved. In a crisis, the most vulnerable suffer the most. Kenaz felt the shuddering impacts of the pandemic firsthand. She's been in the business since 2004 and now has more than 75 outlets across India. 
and about 1,000 employees. COVID uh, has had a huge impact globally. We in India faced one of the severest lockdowns in the world. It was a big setback and a huge challenge, not only for our business, but I think for the entire food and hospitality industry in general. Although this was not a problem unique to us, uh, there was really no comfort in this collective pain. It was one of the toughest uh, years for us. We closed for about two or three weeks. Uh, we halted our operations, our kitchens, our ovens were switched off for the longest time they had ever been since we started the company. I'm not a pastry chef or even close, but I imagine that the symbolic and real trauma of switching off an oven for someone who is, is real. Fortunately for Kenaz, who not so long ago felt like there was no end in sight, things have turned out more than all right. Adapting has been key to survival. So we had to put in a lot of new processes and a lot of new protocols to ensure that this happens when we opened because we didn't know at that point when we would be able to open. We reduced the number of items on our menu. We reviewed our fixed costs. The way we operate is we have central kitchens in each city that we are present in. And we make everything fresh and then transport these fresh products every day to every outlet. So these are generally ultra modern facilities, I would say. We have expert chefs, skilled staff. We try and follow the highest safety standards uh, that we possibly can have. We have invested heavily in our production facilities, our processes, our hygiene protocols. This allowed us to continue serving our guests. And I'm really deeply indebted to my staff for this because they were such superheroes during the COVID pandemic. When most of us said that we were forming a bubble during the pandemic, it felt easy, kind of charming even. But for the staff who worked in places like the Obroma, a bubble is very different. Almost a little military sounding, actually. The staff stayed in our facility. We moved our offices. We converted all our offices into bunkers with social distancing. Everyone just supported the management. They came in. They shut off themselves from their families and friends. They just formed their own little bubble in the kitchen. Uh, They just didn't get out. Uh, They worked, ate and slept and showered and followed protocol, wearing masks, getting used to it, uh, sanitizing your hands every hour, disinfecting the tables where they worked every hour. It was a huge, huge task. She compared the changes that the pandemic forced upon businesses to the abrupt transition that had to be made to air travel following the terrorist attacks against the U.S. in 2001. In the similar way, the aviation industry changed after 9-11. COVID has made permanent changes in the restaurant industry. Globally, we now have a shorter menu, like I said, and I don't think it's ever going to go back to what it was. This is here to stay. And in the midst of this crisis, there was no template to follow either, obviously. It was an unprecedented time, and yet survivors like Kernaz were able to think long term. There are periodic shortages of ingredients, disruption to our operations. Rules and regulations change every single day. There is no one rule that is there for good, you know. But I want our guests to know that we continue to work hard. We do our best to serve them and we will try our best to adapt to whatever challenges that come our way. Samir tells us that business is starting to improve in the sector. At the time of our interview in September, he noted that the last three months had been positive. But still, he warns, cautious optimism rather than all-out optimism is probably a safer bet. Mid to end June, business started picking up. Restaurants were allowed to open in Delhi. So business is increasing for restaurants every month. This is with greater vaccination, more confidence, Delhi, COVID under control. Uh, people are going out and across all segments and formats from you know quick service to cafes to fine dining everything is doing well right now and a lot of restauranters i speak to are saying they actually currently in the last two three months doing better than 2019. Uh, so there is kind of i think cautious optimism in the industry samir echoes kenaz's view that the lockdown has changed the landscape of the restaurant industry forever though most of us don't know it as consumers this is a city that's increasingly filled with ghost kitchens more gently, they're called cloud kitchens. 
I mean, I know what they are, and I know that's where all my Swiggy and Zomato orders are fulfilled, but I've always wondered what they really are. The different terms used for it across the world are virtual kitchen, dark kitchen, cloud kitchen. But they all mean the same thing. It basically means that it's a space where customers cannot walk into because it's in an obscure, not an accessible location, per se. And it's the only business is delivery. And that's what cloud kitchens are. And in different countries, they go by these names, but it's the same globally. In Delhi, what happens, a lot of cloud kitchens open in Lal Dora. You know, these organized villages where, you know, it's legal, you get a health license. So they look like normal kitchens on the inside. They'll be generally ground floor, first floor of some, you know, building. Uh, or they might be in markets, but they'll be then in not high profile commercial markets, you know, kind of the DDA markets, which are not so visible and, you know, not well located. Samir says that there's generally two formats for cloud kitchens. One is a single brand business that's usually between 200 to 400 square feet. Others are much larger. And here, dim sum might be being prepared right next to a kebab roll, and that's right next to a pasta station. In Delhi, at least, the names of the food brands can be quite generic, like Pasta Kitchen or Taste of Thailand. And this is maybe indicative of their depersonalization. But because of the hyper-convenience that they offer, consumers like me turn to these options every day. And let us be reminded that not so long ago, many of us who loved ordering in would have a stack of paper menus, sometimes even laminated paper menus by the phone, like an actual landline that would form a small ordering in altar. I remember my grandmother's collection, actually. She even had little notes in the margin for the dishes that she had tried and loved and reviewed. Order again or not so good, said her notes, which formed her own unique rating system. Sometimes when she dialed in, she would even ask for a particular person to come on the line so that they could recommend to her something which she knew she would love. But this is such a retro fantasy now, and for some, just emblematic of super inconvenient days. There's a lot of cloud kitchen infrastructure happening, which is various players who've come in and are setting up uh, these are international players from Travis Klanik's company, uh, City Storage Systems, to other Indian entrepreneurs. They take two to 3,000, 4,000 square feet and they set up 10, 12 kitchens under one location and provide shared services and then get different brands in. So there's a lot of that happening. And then there are, of course, brands like Inner Chef, Light Bite Foods, a bunch of brands which themselves have seven, eight offerings in terms of cuisines, brands. So they themselves again take this two, three thousand square feet and house all their brands under one roof. Although the cloud kitchen model has received quite a backlash globally from everything from health and safety standards to food quality, Yanaz reminds me why stigmatizing them is not the greatest approach either. The pandemic has created huge difficulties for many people and businesses, but it's also opened up opportunities for others. And I think in the similar way, our world is continually evolving. And with the explosion of delivery and cloud kitchen businesses we are witnessing, we have to play by the rules. There is a need and space for all formats. Our country is large and populous and there are sufficient growth opportunities for everyone. Many brick and mortar businesses are supplementing their income by offering delivery and cook at home boxes. And some businesses starting out today have started purely as cloud kitchens and may eventually become restaurants and cafes. At Theobroma, I think we continue to expand our reach uh, via brick and mortar by opening outlets across multiple cities. But at the same time, a substantial part of our revenue does come from delivery platforms and we recognize that. We have to continually do what is required. And so I think both formats will eventually survive. I don't think it is uh, one or the other. But as of now, definitely online delivery is something that requires attention. Given that restaurants had to close to dining customers during the pandemic, it should come as no surprise that the delivery side of the business has gone up. Hey listeners, let me tell you about another show for Western Radio Collective called Climate Cuisine, hosted by Taiwanese-American journalist Clarissa Wei. Imagine if, instead of eating what's available at the grocery store, we ate ingredients that thrive in our climate. Climate Cuisine explores how sustainable crops are used in similar climate zones around the world. 
In season one, streaming now, Clarissa focuses on the tropics and dives deep into delicious ingredients like bamboo, pigeon pea, and cassava. As the world faces alarming upward shifts in base temperature, these climate-centric conversations about crops will become increasingly important to the resiliency and survival of our food systems. You can listen to Climate Cuisine wherever you get your podcasts. Among those who are still in the business in the aftermath of the roughest days of the pandemic is former graphic designer turned chai cafe owner Jitain Sachte, who is the founder of Jug Mug Thela. What started as a bet with friends led to a pushcart, pop-up shops, and later into a thriving franchise. Jitain and I talked more about what it takes to run a business, pandemic or not. In his view, a lot of people who open restaurants or cafes as passion projects fail because they don't look at it as a business. They mistakenly think of it as some creative project when in fact, success in this creative field ironically requires some amount of delinking from creativity. What the person on the table wants to eat has nothing to do with what you want to produce. There is never a relation. It's a projection perception thing mm. between the creator of the food or the business mm. and the consumer. What does the customer want to eat and what is he going to expect when he reads that name mm-hmm. on the menu mm-hmm. and will he want to order it? This brings me back to what I was saying earlier where I think it's important not to draw the simple binary where cloud kitchens are bad and brick and mortar is good even if we're looking at the question of agency. Though the businesses are obviously vastly different, the thread between the two is that serving the customer even if it means putting aside your own creative instincts, which is often the case, remains biblical, a sturdy pillar of capitalism. And you've got to figure that part out. And when you start looking at it as that kind of an exercise, then the entire passion is kind of gone because you're saying, okay, I want to make this. Now, how do I make this in a way that that person wants to eat it? But the thing is that you're going to have 300, 500 such people every day who will want it differently. So how do you find a lowest common denominator, you know, that hits on everybody's spot? And that's a rational exercise. It is not a creative exercise. It is not a a passion exercise. Chitain has some really good advice for anyone who is even remotely thinking about opening a restaurant in Delhi primary of which, as you may have guessed, is to disentangle creativity with the business. Then there's also the rule about price points and another surprising finding about the organic label, which turns out does not have universally positive connotations or even a uniform meaning for all consumers. But if you appear to be cheap for your target audience, they will mistrust your food. They will believe that you must not be doing something right because how can it be so cheap? And that's a problem. Same with organic food. We have this big struggle here that we use so many organic ingredients, but when we were writing organic in front of them before and nobody would order because this notion that organic food is not delicious and will never be tasty enough or it's just a tactic to jack up the price by calling it organic, those items would not sell. The same item at the same price point without the word organic, it picks up and it starts to move. And then I wonder, what about people who don't have to worry about money? People with really deep pockets? I wonder how much a pre-existing safety net has to do with making it big. So there are businesses I've seen over these years that had the money, but did not align with the customer, did not pivot or overspent on things than what more than needed. But in the food business, as long as you're having to do something to bring customers back, you're not doing something right. Because in terms of the physical experience and the culinary experience, If you've got the two basics right enough for people to like what you're doing and your price points are at a place where they're at comfort, they'll come back. Simply put, Jitain says that having a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have a successful business. Basically, it all comes down to planning and in his opinion, thoughtfulness. So while serving the customer is a standardized, consistent demand, you constantly have to also inject this idea of thoughtfulness into the practice at every step. I kind of think of it as a treadmill of surprise. A lot of people do restaurants with the idea of selling food. That my chef can or I can make a great curry or a great something. And so we will make a restaurant. And everything else is an assembly of accessories to put that food forth. Often without much consideration. You put together, you assemble things just randomly. Yeah without thinking of the customer experience per se. Because a lot of it is very cookie cutter. You have couch on one side, you have a table in the middle, you have two chairs on the other side. You put some nice lights, you put some mirrors, some artwork. And that's a cafe for a lot of people, or at least a small restaurant. 
And these are people who are not very thinking. They are looking at it from a small business perspective. Mm-hmm. These people could just as well be opening a grocery shop or a garment boutique or something else. They just thought like, you know, people will open a boutique because they think my daughter or my, my wife, like she has a nice sense Hi. of dressing and she can go to the tailor and get something made that looks nice. So we should open a garment shop. So I think these people look at food business just the same way. There's a whole lot of other food entrepreneurs, but specifically in the restaurant space who give a lot of thought to what they're doing and how things are going to be. Kenaz has her own advice for anyone looking to open a cafe or restaurant. There is no doubt that you're going to have to work incredibly hard. Starting the business, she says, is the easy part. There will be challenges that must be met head on. Maintaining quality, for example, which she says is the most important aspect of her business. It's not a target, but an ongoing daily commitment. She says a lot of people who focus on expanding their business very quickly tend to forget about quality. She also reflects on the challenges that she's faced in what is clearly still quite a male-dominated industry, not just in India, but globally. The jobs are physically demanding, the hours are unsociable, and, you know, we do have uh, fewer female or women role models. I think the wider business world of F&B, you know, government, bureaucrats, landlords, suppliers, is all disproportionately male. And this can be intimidating and overwhelming to women starting out and young women who don't have uh, much experience in this world. And I have to say, I, I had my share of difficulties. It wasn't easy for me as well, particularly because it was still two decades earlier uh, when I started out. And I've uh, had to face uh, comments, discrimination, even prejudice. I had to overcome these obstacles. I did work hard. I had to prove myself again and again to the same set of people. But I think I eventually I earned my seat at the table. I think as women, we have to make ourselves heard and create a change that we want to see. There's no point in just continuously crying about it. I think we must be part of the change. Men and women, I think, have to learn to work side by side and share the work environment. Women do have the bigger challenge in front of them. But over time, I think things are improving and we are moving in the right direction. So I think it's good to focus on the changes that and how far we have come. Kianas has a younger daughter of her own now, and it's clear to me that her tough-as-nails, consistent work ethic will pass down. I hope you've enjoyed our conversations with restaurant owners and experts and learned a thing or two. If you were at all thinking about opening a place yourself, maybe you've been inspired or maybe even discouraged. Either way, I think that it's been important to remember that restaurant running is a real hard job, and it's not always rewarding. Though sometimes, sometimes there are these lovely little reflections that keep people like Hena's going. Theo Broma has allowed me to bring a smile to people, to create joy to the guests that we serve. And all I can say is that I am extremely privileged to be part of uh, so many people's uh, happy occasions. That is really what has kept me going uh, in this business. We hope you'll join us again for our next episode of Bad Table Manners and Beyond. This episode is possible because of all the people who work behind the scenes. I'd like to thank my producer Jennifer O'Neill, co-script editor Vidya Balachandar, audio editor Evan Lindsay, researchers Julia Fine and Carolyn Crosby, and intern Kai Stone. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder Stephen Satterfield, Whetstone Radio Collective executive producer Celine Glacier, sound engineer Max Kotelchuk, associate producer Quentin Lebeau, and sound intern Simon Leibendar. You can subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can learn more about Bad Table Manners at whetstoneradio.com.